Let's face it, business technology is frustrating and complex. So how do you make sure it works for your team? To make IT right, start the discussion at go-domain.com. You're listening to Discussions by Domain, a podcast for business leaders. Our discussions may be with people you've probably heard of before, but the majority of our guests are in the trenches, professionals like you and I, with the same challenges and struggles of keeping up in the Northeast. They're implementing strategies, overcoming hurdles. They're leading the fastest growing businesses in our region. My name is Anthony DeGraw, Director of Partnerships at Domain Computer Services and the host of this show. When I'm not talking with business leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of Domain and the ups and downs of our own growth journey as we intend to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. So welcome to another episode of Discussions by Domain. Today I have Ryan Cooper, principal of Cooper LLC Law Firm in Cranford, New Jersey. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Anthony. Glad no problem. Here. Uh, Ryan, before we get into the topic today, can you just quickly introduce yourself, sure. uh, give us a little background about you yourself, and then how the firm got started? Sure, sure. Um, so Cooper LLC, uh, we are a full-service commercial law firm. Uh, my practice focuses on privacy and cybersecurity, information security, and issues uh, arising out of technology. But we have uh, three lawyers. Uh, we have offices in Cranford, New York, and Pennsylvania. Awesome. Uh, Philadelphia. Yeah. And um, we uh, have a, a full complement of commercial litigation and commercial transaction services. Okay. Yeah. Very good. And uh, give us a little rundown on how you got started in law and, sure. uh, and your, your slight history in that area. Sure, sure. Um, you know, it's been a, a roundabout course, as, as it often is. Uh, so I graduated law school. I, I worked for a federal judge first, uh, went to a large law firm in Manhattan, then transitioned my practice to New Jersey, uh, where I had a lot of ties. I grew up here and, and had a lot of connections and relationships that I wanted to build upon. And uh, as a, a junior to, to mid-commercial litigation attorney at the time, I, I was uh, increasingly interested in the ways that technology were, was not only changing my practice, but yeah. was going to uh, create a whole new realm of legal risk for my clients. Um, and it was a it was a terrific melding um, of my innate interest already uh, uh, into technology and tinkering. Uh, you know, I, I don't have a science uh, degree, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, was also but, but was someone who always took things apart when I was a little kid. Oh. It's amazing I never electrocuted myself. <laughs> well, I did, but permanently. <laughs> uh, but I, I always loved to take things apart. I always loved to understand how things worked, and um, uh, and I was always interested in technology and finding ways to use technology to make my life more more uh, efficient. And so I had that, that innate interest, and as I saw the proliferation of devices, the proliferation of electronic data, the ease at which we can move huge volumes of electronic data without the, the friction, uh, the cost of, of, yeah. of literally boxing it up and moving it with a truck anymore. You can move now truckloads of, of paper across the globe within a, a few seconds. Yeah. I, I began to see, I didn't see all of this then, I would have been rather uh, clairvoyant of me, <laughs> yeah. but, but I began to, to be very interested in how this was going to affect my clients. Okay. So uh, it must have been 10 years now, which seems hard to believe. It seems a lot more recent than that. Uh, I started exploring what these risks might look like, what the legal landscape might look like, and um, uh, and pursued it from there. And uh, three years ago, uh, I started Cooper LLC with just myself. And we're three lawyers now, as I mentioned, and we're hoping to uh, add a few more before the year's over. Very good. Well, congrats on the success so far, and I'm looking forward to getting into the topic of today. Great. Me too. So we're going to get into the topic today, which is there is no magic checklist for information security. Just wanted to get your quick insights on what made you come up with that topic, sure. and your recent, you're going to shortly come out with a blog post on this uh, mm -hmm. yourself uh, that will be published, but what made you think of this topic all? Sure. Uh, so I, I think as we, we both have experienced, clients uh, are always in a hard spot to understand what is the what is the gold standard of information security? Yeah. Um, and I think the shocking answer is that there is no, there is a, a gold standard we want to achieve, but uh, there is no checklist that you can just mark off the boxes uh, and, and say, congratulations. I'm good to go. Here's the gold standard. You got it. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, I think there's there's two questions that that um, you and I have talked about in the past um, that clients have to confront. Uh, one is is whether or not they're um, protecting information for third party risk, uh, which is when clients have uh, other people's information that they need to keep secure. Um, now that may be clients who have consumer data, uh, or maybe clients uh, who are vendors to other businesses, and um, and so that's that's one level of security. And then there's another uh, another basket, uh, which is first party uh, yeah. security, and uh, that is clients I have who who have. Uh, very valuable and proprietary information. It may be sales data. It may be intellectual property, such as trademarks or patents, yeah. et cetera. And, and so that's that's often the first question that we need to confront. And then uh, beyond that, if you look at a lot of the standards organizations, there is uh, conflicting information. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know the example that you and I were talking about that led to our conversation today uh, and that I'll be blogging about is um, – just, uh, I think in April, Microsoft, a, a huge uh, industry player uh, that has baseline security configurations for its software, uh, abandoned uh, its recommendation that users implement an automatic password expiration policy, okay. uh, which I'm sure many of us are familiar with. That's yeah. when your system tells you it's been 90 days, 60 days, whatever it may have been, and you now have to change your password. And um, that was a, a, a policy recommendation that NIST, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, had abandoned a few years ago. Uh, and, and those of us practitioners like yourself and I uh, in the business have uh, had long realized that those policies often were pound, uh, penny wise and pound foolish. They, they were well intentioned, but often led to workarounds by the user uh, that would uh, undermine security more than the policy uh, augmented it. And um, so how do, how do clients navigate that? Which standard do they do they adhere to is a, is a challenge. And so, um, you know, my mantra, as, as I know yours is, is uh, really customizing uh, an information security program uh, to the client's specific needs. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Couldn't agree more with that. Yeah. Walk us through your defense and maybe proactive litigation of these third parties and what does that look like? Sure. And, and you're right. I mean, as you and I have been talking about, you see third parties being uh, the target more and more. And, and that's because they're, they're, they're aggregators. They're a gateway either. They, they've aggregated data from a bunch of different clients yeah. uh, and therefore uh, a hacker can get a bigger pot uh, in a single hit or they have, they have the gateways to, to multiple clients. Um, so I think, uh, so first proactively, I think there are three, three things I, I always hammer clients about when okay. we want to prepare ourselves and position ourselves to be strongest against third-party risk. And, and the first issue is co uh, smart contract policies. They will in include certifications from the vendor as to their security requirements okay. uh, or their security standards that they meet our clients' re requirements. Okay. Uh, they need to have insurance yeah. provisions and, and, and not just... Yes, you have certain numbers of uh, certain amounts of insurance coverage, not just insurance certificates. Um, you and I were, uh, I think, exchanging some comments on LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago uh, about a vendor that went bankrupt, uh, which will leave the, the damaged clients on the hook for it. Uh, you need to make sure that you're added as an additional insured on those policies so you have direct access. So uh, contract provision terms, you need to then follow up and actually implement those contract provisions. So particularly when you have a contract that allows you to do diligence your vendors, you really got to do that. Okay. And, and you can and you should. And that's why you put it in there in the contract in the first place. Yes. Uh, and that's twofold. One, uh, you need to do diligence to make sure your vendor's doing what they said uh, they are going to do. Uh, and also, in, to jump ahead for a second to the litigation side, if that vendor does get um, hacked or, or there's an intrusion uh, and your business's data or your client's data is uh, accessed, you may be held to account. You had to do diligence right, and you never do diligence uh, your your um, your vendor security. And had you do diligence your vendor security, maybe you would have uh, learned uh, something that would have caused you to do something differently. Okay. So that's that's a, a critical provision. Um, and then and then insurance for yourself. Um, I, I'm a big proponent that any comprehensive information security plan has to have its own crafted in cyber insurance policy for the areas you can't secure. Okay. Um, you know, uh, an analogy I like to use is, is, is to day-to-day to -day lives. Um, we, take, we take steps to secure our assets in different ways, right? We, we don't have all our assets 
in our in our homes, right? We may have we Correct. keep money in a bank because yeah. there's institutional security there. Uh, we might keep um, uh, jewelry or other you know uh, very expensive items in a safe or a safe deposit box uh, because of that. But at the end of the day, we also have insurance because yeah. you can't protect everything absolutely all the time, and so you need to have an insurance policy that is designed so that if the worst should happen, that you do have coverage that will help you make yeah. you whole or, 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 or cover you for your liability. Um, so that's, that's really a proactive step, and it's, it's contracts, it's due diligence, and it's insurance. Um, and then litigating, or not hopefully pre-litigation, yeah, um, yeah. in the event you do have a third party who uh, suffers a, a hack, a vendor, um, you know, that's, that is tough to map out. But um, you know, first and foremost is an assessment uh, of, of what has occurred. Uh, that's, that also really goes back to the contract terms. Yeah. If you have a vendor and uh, you have a provision that the vendor needs to lo let you know in the event there's been a data breach, those contract terms can take a million different forms. Okay. And in fact, a lot of times if it just says, well, if you are breached, you need to let me know. Well, a vendor, as we all know in the, in the business, a, a vendor may suspect they've been breached, but not sure they've been breached for a substantial period of time. And they may read the contract and say, well, I don't know that I've been breached, I just think I've been breached, and I'm not gonna tell all my clients that I've been breached until I'm certain. Um, and, and that can be, that is a tremendous amount of time uh, that could um, you know, be detrimental. So 100%, there's, yeah. there's another contract provision. You may wanna, um, you know, you, we wanna craft terms so that uh, my clients are alerted as soon as there's a suspicion of a breach. Because then we can take preactive, pre uh, preemptive yeah. steps to minimize liability. Yeah, I think the average right now—I could be wrong—but I think is now nine months where these, the, you know, they're living on different systems, mm -hmm. and nine months goes by. Right. I mean, they've taken or seen everything right. that they need to see. Absolutely. That, and uh, like you said, the the quicker everybody knows, the quicker everybody can quickly re respond. Right. You know. Absolutely, and protect their own rights. And and so you know, responding to that, you you want to assess the situation as soon as possible. Uh, cut off access to your own network if if that's the nature okay. of the vendor's relationship. You certainly don't want to be in a position where a vendor's uh, getting maybe daily or or weekly dumps uh, of your data as part of the uh, service agreement, um, and uh, you something you wouldn't continue to do if you thought there was a risk that there's been a uh, intrusion on on the vendor side. Yeah. Wow. So real, real good stuff. Thank, Thank you, you for sharing all of this. Uh, Ryan is also going to be putting out his own blog post on this topic yep. that, that'll be covered. Uh, we'll be writing something up as well and link to it. But let's switch gears a little sure. bit. Uh, let's get to know who Ryan is. Sure. Uh, I'm going to start with the book or books maybe you've gifted the most to other uh -huh. individuals or that have changed your thought process the most over, over your career, sure. that's, life, that's, whatever it is. Th that is a great question. I'm, I'm a huge fan of books, um, and I don't get to read as much as, uh, yeah. as I like to, as I used to. My stack keeps going higher and higher, and the kids don't allow me to get to any of them. Yep. Yeah, yeah my, exactly. I was saying, it sounds like our nightstands look exactly <laughs> yeah. the same. You know, that's a terrific question. I, and a lot of books have been hugely influential on me over the years. What I keep coming back to, uh, and, and those who know me best have probably heard me talk about this, is um, a series of books that Robert Caro, who's a biographer, has okay. written. Um, he wrote The Power Broker, which is about Robert Moses, uh, yeah. an individual in the first half of the 20th century that really shaped modern New York. And uh, that book is it's just an amazing biography. I love biographies because they're, they're such a, a great combination of uh, history uh, as well as psychological profile. Yeah. And, um, you know, The Power Broker was amazing because it's not directly related to my day-to-day -day work, but it's just an amazing profile of how government power uh, has an amazing ability to both improve the lives uh, of, of residents and citizens as well as... Um, as well as destroy them, to be, to be totally honest with you. Yeah. And, uh, the, the story of Robert Moses is, is a story of a man who used government power to do both. Uh, and so it's fascinating. And he, he also went on to re write um, Robert Moses, that, or, sorry, Robert Caro, that is, went on to write a series of uh, biographies on Lyndon Johnson. Okay. Uh, and and um, uh, another one of my favorites, uh, because if you ever want to read what's probably the most thrilling true life legal thriller. There's there's no murder uh, involved, but, okay. <laughs> but it, 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 it's 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 more thrilling than than I think you could ever write in fiction. And and that's the second biography he wrote of Lyndon Johnson. Uh, he tells a story of of how Lyndon Johnson literally stole the 1948 Texas Senate election, and how. Um, uh, the court was was literally on the cusp of opening the ballot box 
that would have proved that the election had been fraudulent. And he won that he led election by literally 87 votes. Okay. Um, and it was uh, enjoined by the Supreme Court. And, and I, I believe, I haven't read the book in a number of years, but I believe there's an individual literally running down the hall to, to yell stop to the, the judge to stop the proceedings in, in a few minutes longer. Uh, the whole the whole game would have been given up. It's, it's, wow. it, and I'm sure I didn't do it justice, but it's um, called The Means of Ascent, and it's okay. a, just a fascinating book. And uh, I, I talk about it frequently because uh, it's, it is truer than, than fiction. And if, if it was fiction, you wouldn't believe it. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. You know? No, those are good recommendations. Definitely yeah. haven't come up before, so good okay. stuff. Good. Let's go to a uh, either a thought leader or a I, – I like the, the other – term of like everyday practitioner mm -hmm. who is really uh, making a name for themselves. Maybe you've worked with them mm -hmm. and they really have delivered on what you've asked them to deliver on or you were surprised mm -hmm. by the results they actually got or just their ethic that the audience should know about here in the Northeast uh, region. Sure, sure. Um, well, you know, I think I'll address both. I mean, in terms of uh, uh, someone who has been a tremendous resource and an individual you and I both know is Rob Klieger at yeah. Digital Forensics. He's a, a forensics expert, has been a friend for a number of years, and uh, whenever we've worked together, uh, Rob has delivered in, in ways that, awesome. that always surpass expectations, uh, has been a terrific uh, resource uh, of information for me. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, a great um, partner in, in in a number of matters that we've we've been able to work together awesome, on. Yeah. yeah, thought leaders. You know, I, I have to. I can't go without mentioning um, Bob Chesler at Anderson Kill. Uh, is a, another large law firm. Bob is um, certainly not new on the scene. He's he's really a thought leader. He helped. I think in my opinion, uh, invent the insurance coverage practice uh, in the 1980s. No uh, way. He awesome. and I, I had the pleasure of working with Bob when I was a young attorney. He was really like a mentor to me, and uh, we continue to be great friends, uh, and I think uh, is, is also a terrific resource. And in terms of insurance coverage for policyholders, there's, there's no one could go wrong with uh, with, with uh, talking to Bob, and, and he's uh, someone uh, whose uh, expertise and friendship I, I rely on frequently. Yeah, yeah. I, I've had the pleasure of meeting him, I think, twice now, yeah. and just the knowledge and his authenticity just comes out yeah. in, in his passion for what he does, uh, and it's great. Yeah. It's awesome. Absolutely. Let's go to uh, a nonprofit organization or a charity that you're involved mm -hmm. with or you support that you'd like to get some recognition to as well. Sure. Um, you know, and there's there's so many. That's that is a very tough question, particularly in a state like New Jersey. So that's that's a terrific question. Um, I've had the pleasure of, of being um, a part of or or working with a number of nonprofits uh, over the, the course of my career so far. Um, I highly recommend the American Civil Liberties Union of New Jersey, okay. uh, the ACLU of New Jersey. Uh, it was an organization I got to be a member of the trustees for uh, a number of years back. And it's an organization that um, those who think they know it uh, might be surprised. Uh, but it's really an organization out there that, that's fighting for uh, individual rights uh, of everyone you know, on a daily basis. And I think they're a, a really important uh, counterweight in our society right now. So uh, I highly recommend them. Good stuff. Yeah. yeah, we'll definitely make sure that we link to them. Ty, we'll link to them in the in the show notes oh, there great. to go directly to their site so people can check them out. Oh, great. We'll finish fantastic. with what advice would you give to, I want to say like, I don't want to say like 21-year-old self. I want to say sure. like 24, 25-year-old self. You're that sure you know, young new attorney on the block and, uh, and uh, you know, what advice looking back now, you started your own firm, you've been in business for 10 years, sure. all of this stuff. What advice would you go back and give that, that individual? Oh, that's, you know, at 24, I was still finding myself in many ways. Yeah, uh, a lot, a lot of who I am was, was there already, but, but a lot of, uh, a lot was not. And I think that was a lot uh, there was a lot of my personality that, that I was still looking for, as I, I think probably most of us were. Yeah. Um, you know, I was still in law school um, uh, and, at, at that age. Um, and, um, you know, I think hard work, uh, I'm a huge proponent of hard work. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the goals, when you're 24, the goals seem very far away. Yes. Uh, a couple years seems like a lifetime. Yes. And um, I think uh, that was something... Um, I had a long-term perspective. I was fortunate to, to have that at that age. Okay. And um, I think my advice to, would be to, to continue to stick with that. It would be to, to um, 
reinforce that, that someone uh, is on the right track with, yeah. with a long-term perspective. Okay. Uh, patience. Patience, yeah. Patience, patience and perseverance. Okay. Grit. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure really. Grit is a, a topic that's talked about frequently nowadays, and I, I steadfastly believe that is a huge factor in success. Yeah. Is, I, is I getting up every day and, and showing up. Showing up. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. One of the things that I've learned over I would say I'm still learning every Absolutely. single day, but over the especially the last year is the patience part of it. Right, like a year isn't that much time in yeah. the grand scheme of things, and right. uh, just be more patient. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, you know what? One thing I'll add, I think consistent yeah. with patience is perspective. Um, maybe not so much in twenty at, at twenty four, but certainly over the course of my career, um, I have learned that keeping things in perspective. Is, is so important and I think is, is not always done. Um, yeah. it, it's not, and it, it, I think it, I distinguish it from, it's not that you don't take things seriously. Uh, I think you can take things seriously with, while, while keeping things in perspective. And I think keeping a perspective about things uh, helps keep uh, a, an even keel and helps keep thought uh, objective yeah. and, and helps uh, prevent decisions from being rash, which, which are, as we know, have collateral consequences and, and snowballing effects. So, yeah. yeah. And I think that goes hand in hand with patients. hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. So good stuff. So everybody, Ryan Cooper yeah, from Cooper you. LLC in Cranford, New Jersey. We'll make sure we link to not only his website so you can get in touch with him if you need proactive, proactive yes, support right. for uh, information security policies, vendor risk management. Uh, these are all topics that we preach every single day and hearing it from yes. a third party uh, just validates that, uh, that you should be doing this in, in an individual that's fighting these battles every day in the, in the, in the courtrooms and yeah. litigating them. Uh, so we'll link to him and his organization uh, directly to their website. We'll also link to your LinkedIn right. profile. You are fairly active on LinkedIn. I try to. Which yeah. I like. Uh, yeah. I think it's you a too. great platform. Yeah. And uh, so we'll link to that as well. Ryan, thank great. you for being on. Anthony, I really appreciate you having me. Thank you. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show in iTunes or your favorite podcast player. This guarantees that every episode will get delivered directly to your device. To help us get the word out, share with a friend, leave a review, and check out our discussions on the web at go-domain.com podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.